Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to Our Community with Whitney Prather. Learn about what's happening in Stark and Tuscarora's counties and the surrounding areas. We're going to highlight interesting people, businesses, organizations, churches, events, and even more. Stay tuned. I'm excited to share Jennifer Dyer with you today. She's the Director of Operations at the Akron Kent Regional Food Bank. She's been with the food bank for 10 years and is living with so much purpose. If you've ever had a full circle moment, then you're going to be able to relate to this story. Jennifer was once food insecure, and now she's an integral part of an operation that helps families like the one that she was raised in. In this interview, she shares how it took courage for her to transition, and I want to encourage you today to be courageous in the face of uncertainty in your own life. There are many practical factors that keep us stagnant and in positions of safety, Well, the truth is the safest place is actually in the will of God. So be sure to follow his leading because he is definitely speaking. Okay, so on to Jennifer. Enjoy this interview. Hey, everyone, our community with Whitney Prather. I'm talking to Jennifer Dyer with the Akron Canton Regional Food Bank. Jennifer, how are you? Hi, I'm doing great. How are you? I'm great as well. It's awesome to see your smiling face. For those of you who don't know, we're doing this over Zoom and I am joined by Jennifer's just bright and beaming face. (laughs) (laughs) Jennifer, so many people may be familiar with the food bank, but for those that are not, why don't you tell us about your mission? Sure. So um, the Akron Canton Regional Food Bank's mission is pretty simple. It's um, to feed people and to fight hunger. And um, for us, um, that's really, really important work. It's foundational work. Um, Everyone needs to eat. It's a basic need. And um, very recently, we went through um, a strategic revision where we created a new vision, which is to have a thriving community free of hunger. And so that's our work. That's awesome. How has your operations changed during Um, for this pandemic. Tell me about that. Uh, It's been remarkable, uh, the impact and the change that a pandemic like this virus has had. And I'm sure, you know, a lot of people can relate to that in different ways. But for us, uh, the amount of new families in need just skyrocketed. Mm -hmm. Um, It went up 30 percent from what we would typically see. Um, Our demand for food went up 20 percent. And, you know, what really tugs up my heartstrings is the increased need. You know, there's a face to these numbers and um, the faces that just kill me and break my heart are the children. And there was an estimated increase of 51 percent of children in need facing food insecurity. And um, for us, um, that's our work. That's our our mission. And our purpose is to um, close those meal gaps. And sadly, the meal gaps are widening right now. Mm -hmm. Um, So for us, um, we had to really get creative in in how we accomplish this work because um, we had to protect our people here. And so a lot of the work that we do is done predominantly with volunteers, people that are willing to give up their time. And this pandemic had um, everyone really you know, questioning how they interact with the community and perhaps choosing not to volunteer with organizations like ours. And so um, what we had to do, we had to double down. Um, Our staff has never worked harder than they have this year. But then also we've been incredibly blessed with the National Guard. So we've had um, over 40 National Guard members that have been at the food bank since March, since the beginning of this pandemic. And, you know, they say many hands make lighter work, and that's so, so true. And for us, um, the National Guard has really been such a blessing. Um, They have replaced those hands of volunteers that have come through and um, helped repack food boxes, emergency food boxes. Um, They have actually went out to different programs that we support 
and help them repack food boxes and distribute food. We have had to engage them in helping to deliver food, which is new to the food bank. Um, so with their military vehicles, they're going out there to local churches um, that are operating these small food pantries and helping you know bring the food closer to them. And then we also have um, on-site monthly food giveaways here at the food bank in Akron. And so they have been a part of that process. And um, again, that's new work. We've had to really shift, get creative and think of new ways to get the food out to people as quickly as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Talk about an operation. So what are you, what are you needing from the community? How can the community engage with the food bank right now? I know that you guys are open to donations. How else can they engage volunteering, donating? Donating right now um, is the number one. Um, We need the financial support. Again, with this increased uh, demand for food, um, donations, local donations have have fallen off um, from our local grocers and retailers and manufacturers. And so what we've had to do is get creative and buy food. Um, We've had to find new ways of getting the food here. Um, And um, it's not it's not cheap (laughs) to do that. So um, every dollar counts, every dollar creates four meals uh, for the community. So just think about, you know, that cup of Starbucks that you're getting in the morning, that $5 cup of coffee, that's 20 meals. Um, So um, a little goes a long way. And um, for me, when I first came to the food bank, that really put things in perspective. And I think about how I choose to spend money on, you know, my little holiday cup that I'm holding right now, Starbucks. Um, That is 20 meals that I'm holding in my hand. So um, that's that, that it really is. And um, that's the best way, you know, and if I think of who can't give a dollar, who can't give five dollars. Um, and we've actually seen a, a increase in support financially, but still the need um, is present and it's continuing to grow. And with this, you know, world of uncertainty that we're in right now, not, not knowing what's going to happen changes upon us um, and not knowing what next year looks like. Um, the more financial donations we can get, the better just to ensure that we are able to, you know, complete our mission and feeding people and, you know, bringing those increased statistics down of yeah. the number of children um, that are facing hunger and individuals facing hunger. We need to close the gap, not widen it. Mm -hmm. And we do that through the community support. But then also, you know, you mentioned volunteers and, you know, we have reopened for volunteers. The numbers are certainly a lot smaller than what we would typically have come in and host anywhere from 50 to 100 volunteers at a time. Well, with COVID, we really had to, again, get creative and think of how we can safely host the community and have them come come in to give up their their time and talents to help repack food for people in need. So um, we are limiting our volunteer group sizes to anywhere from 20 to 25. And you can go to our website, akroncantonfoodbank.org, and you can go to the Get Involved page and find a number of different opportunities that are posted to volunteer. Wonderful. Now, you've been there for 10 years in your role as director of operations. Um, You're really behind the scenes. Um, Mm -hmm. Tell me about the times that you do get to interface with families or if that's changed during this pandemic at all. So um, a couple years ago, we piloted an on-site distribution. It's an on-site food food giveaway. Our... uh, I would say core business model has not been to interact directly um, with those in need. Um, We are essentially the food distribution center for over 500 programs throughout eight counties in Northeast Ohio. Okay. Um, It's Carol Holmes. I have to use my fingers here. (laughs) Carol Holmes, um, Wayne, Tuss, Stark, Summit, Medina, and Portage um, are the counties that we support. And so um, these are predominantly faith-based organizations, uh, local churches that choose to open up a food pantry to help their community directly, and they get their food from us. Um, so although we may not be in your backyard, we are certainly help helping to put the food in your community. Um, so 
that has been the traditional business model. But again, a couple years ago, we wanted to find a way that we could complement the work that's being done in the community by those programs, by also running our own. And so this year in particular, um, we've seen a, a rise in the numbers of families that would come to our on-site distributions. Typically, we would have anywhere from four to 500 families um, at the peak of COVID during a two hour on-site distribution, we had over 1800 families wow. come to our food bank in Akron. And, you know, there there's a face to hunger, uh, but every face is different. And you would be shocked to see the number of people that come through that mm. you just, you, you would never guess uh, that they are struggling with hunger. Um, and it's heartbreaking when you see that uh, family, uh, you see that woman, a single mother that's coming here that had never had to ask for help before. Um, we've had pretty emotional moments um, during these on-site distributions where it just, again, makes my work feel so purposeful and our work uh, feel so purposeful in the community. Yeah. You have a pretty remarkable connection to the food bank. And when I heard you share about your own story of being food insecure as a child, I thought, wow, how significant that you're operating in the role that you get to operate in. Um, you know, uniquely what these families and these individuals are going through. How has your past and your present affected you? Well, I will tell you, I didn't realize growing up how significant it, it would be in my life uh, because I thought it was normal. Um, we were a family of six uh, living in a two bedroom home in the southwest end of Canton. And I can recall so many times opening up my refrigerator or the cupboards and seeing little to no food and um, the constant feeling of my belly, you know, rumbling, you know, I just, I thought that was normal. Um, a lot of my friends that I grew up with, um, they too lived that way, which is why I didn't think anything was wrong with it. Um, it wasn't until I got older um, and began to transition into you know junior high and high school where your circle broadens and you see other people um, that have it differently and um, for me that's where I went oh wow um, this is bad <laughs> this is this is not good and thankfully um, my mother's mother, my maternal grandmother, she um, was the vice president of First Merit, and um, she made sure that we had food on the table. My mom was too proud to ask for help. Um, there's some shame that comes with it, an embarrassment. Mm -hmm. um, and for her, um, she didn't really have the courage and bravery that it takes to ask for help. But my grandmother was able to, to provide food. So once a week, she would take us grocery shopping, and she would make sure that that her grandchildren and her daughter and the family were all fed. Um, but even then it still wasn't enough. So um, for me, it kind of set the stage for, you know, direction for me um, in my life, as far as my career is concerned. Um, things that you think you want. Um, and for me, I, I swore I never wanted to be in that position. I never wanted um, my kids to open the refrigerator and see no food. So I did everything within my power to make sure that they would have a different life. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure a lot of people share in that same belief, regardless of how they were raised and brought up, is that we always want better for our family and for our kids. And so that was it. It just kind of set the stage for me and my career, my academics, and um, where I'm at today. I chose this path because of how I grew up. Yeah. Well, talk to me a little bit about some of the mindsets that you had starting out as soon as you got on your own. You know, you were determined to succeed. I can mm -hmm. imagine, you know, you just setting out with, with thinking like, you know what? I'm not going to go that path. I need to, I need to focus on this. I need to focus. So tell me a little bit about that. And it, it ultimately ended you up in a, in a role at FedEx. 
Right. Right. So um, right out of high school, I was really trying to figure out, okay, what do I want to do with my life? But more so, how can I make a lot of money? Like that was my focus. I just, I was so determined to provide financial security for myself and for my future family that I went after money. And so I started to um, get onto a path to be a computer programmer. I thought, this is where the money's at. And um, it was, however, um, it was not wired for me. I'm not wired for that. And so I shifted my thinking to, okay, you don't know really what you want to do when you grow up. You just know that you want to make money and you want to make it now. So um, I put my college um, education plan on hold until I figured out what I wanted to do when I grew up. And I jumped right into a career with FedEx. So um, it was very early on in my career. I worked for FedEx Custom Critical, where um, I realized HR was something that I would like and um, I would be good at and I can make some money doing that. So um, that's what I really jumped into and um, had a career in HR there for over 10 years. But um, and I was fulfilled and very happy and financially secure, but um, nothing was tugging at my heartstrings. Mm -hmm. And so that's really what caused me to reflect and think about how much time we spend at work and, you know, what's the purpose, what's the purpose and what's the heart connection. Mm -hmm. Um, So I didn't want it to feel like a career transaction. I really wanted more of a heart transaction, a heart connection to the work that I was doing. And I found it here at the food bank. What a wonderful story. I think we all can really relate to, you know, our, our past dictating what our, our next steps are. And then you just have a moment of like, I need to, I need to be able to connect with humans here. I need to computer programming Mm -hmm. sounds amazing, but wow, what a transformational (laughs) change that you're making in the community right now and talk to me even though it's kind of like you packaged it up like okay now I'm here but it probably took some courage for you to move and to make these steps it took some some you had to get clear in your mind about what you wanted your life to look like yes and you know I was I wasn't even looking for a job when I found out about the opportunity at the food bank. Uh, We were recruiting at the time at FedEx for an HR position, and I had a Google alert set up just to look at local competition. And that's when I received the alert about this opportunity at the food bank. And I thought, oh, my goodness. How awesome would it be to do the work that I've been doing here at FedEx for an organization that fights food insecurity and poverty, uh, which is how I grew up. And I thought, oh, my goodness, my life could come like full circle. But it was frightening because I was not looking for a job. I wasn't even a passive job seeker. Uh, I was very content with my career at FedEx and, in fact, thought I would retire from this. There. So I thought everything happens for a reason. Even though I wasn't looking, it came to me. So I feel compelled to do something with this. And that's where I just dug deep and I did a lot of soul searching and knew, you know, in transitioning from a for profit to not for profit, that financial security that I so badly desired was going to shift and change. <laughs> so uh, for me, um, I really had to hold firm to my values. And, you know, it was when I had my family, when I had my daughter. Um, and that's where I thought I need to expose her to the community and to have various ways to make an impact. And then later in life, I had my son. So um, they're now 16 and five. And for me, the work that I do is just I want them to be proud of it. Yeah. I want them to say, my mom's making a difference in the community. And my mom is helping, you know, people that I may know put food on the table. Uh, that is more rewarding than any 
amount of money. It really is just feeling good about the work that you do. Um, and having the courage to chase that, uh, is something that I learned uh, throughout this process when this job opportunity came to me. Mm-hmm. So, uh, it definitely took courage, uh, bravery and strength, but it was the best decision I ever made for me and for my family. Yeah. What would you say to someone who is just wanting to make a change similar to, how you made a change, but is not feeling brave. Their practical circumstances are keeping them a little bit stuck. What would you say to that person? I would say um, to lean on your your tribe and your network of people uh, that can be an advocate for you, an encourager for you, mm-hmm. and um, just even a sounding board to to talk and you know what is it that you're doing that you love? What is it that you want to do that you're not currently doing? And to think about, again, what's going to make you feel good at the end of the day? What's going to make you feel good about yourself and going home and saying, this is what mommy did today at work. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is what daddy did today at work um, to, to share that piece of you with your family. Um, and again, just being open and honest with yourself. I mean, that's what what really it, it boils down to is understanding you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Jennifer, it is so special to speak with you. Thank you for <laughs> sharing the mission of the food bank. And most of all, thank you for sharing your personal story with food insecurity and how you're on the other side of that and making a real transformational um, change in this community. I really appreciate you. And I know our listeners do too. Oh, thanks so much, Whitney. Thank you to our guest today and thank you for tuning in. Cheers until next time.